Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, got a really great crowd here on a cold day, and I was just speaking with someone saying, I wish I had sort of chosen a happier topic for the holidays, but... Um, it, yeah, but... It, and then I reflected on this morning, I was saying, none of my topics have been too happy, <laughs> they've been too positive or uplifting, so I apologize for that for the, for the, uh, the holiday season. But yeah, I was also reflecting on having you know, a history discussion today, history lecture today, about what we've observed the last couple days with the passing of uh, George H.W. Bush, number 41, and really what a, you know, what a good man he was, whether you, you agree with his politics or not. So I just wanted to mention that. Well, t uh, today we're going to talk about the rise of ultranationalism in Germany, Italy, and Japan, um, and, uh, which is a significant, obviously, time during the 1930s. Uh, last month we looked at the 1930s uh, domestically, what was going on in the Depression, uh, what the, uh, how the country was changed by the New Deal. Um, so now we're going to look at internationally what's going on, not so much with the United States, uh, but with uh, overseas, which are, of course, going to have a tr uh, profound impact on the United States um, as it was. So let's get, well, first of all, I want to introduce uh, my wife, Jana, who's our projectionist. And, uh, and don't worry, she baked. Good. So, uh, <laughs> So, the rise of ultranationalism. Let's take a look at the agenda. As you know, I always have an essential question. And our central question today, our central question I want you to think about as we discuss the rise of ultranationalism. So, what circumstances would have to occur for ultranationalism, either in the form of militarism, fascism, or Nazism? Of course, they probably wouldn't be purely one of those. It might be some sort of hybrid but uh, to take hold in the United States in the 21st century. So could we face something like that? So I want you to, to think about that as we, as we look uh, at what happened in the 1930s. So we're going to talk about, obviously, the rise of ultranationalism, of militarism is what I'm calling it in Japan, fascism in Italy, and Nazism in Germany. And then we'll have a discussion at the end. So Empire of the Rising Sun, or militarism in Japan. And to really understand it, we need to look at the background. And as you know, Japan was in isolation for about 250 years, a self-isolation, uh, in the Tagawa uh, shogunate. And it ended in 18, around 1860s. Uh, it was a feudal-style government led by a series of powerful warlords, or shoguns, as they were called, who kept Japan, the country itself, and the emperor in isolation. So the, it was an interesting um, dynamic there. The emperor was really thought to be a god, but he was basically under house arrest, very nice house arrest, in a palace, uh, all the emperors were over this long period of time. The shoguns, these warlords, were controlling the country. 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry sail, sails into Edo Bay and demanded that Japan open up its ports to trade with the United States. So this is gunboat diplomacy, uh, going with a, mo a modern warship. Japan was still very much in, in the feudal age. Uh, they had not modernized, and so they really had no defenses or no offense, if you will, to, to uh, follow this. So they had to go along with Perry's demands. And this contact left, led to a treaty, the uh, Kanagawa Treaty of 1854, which is going to end Japan's long period of isolation. And the treaty was one of several unequal treaties. Now, an unequal treaty is just the way it sounds. The United States was in a more powerful position than Japan. What it meant practically was that uh, people, merchants or, or naval personnel, while they were in Japan, could, act, could actually live under uh, 
uh, U.S. law. And if they got in trouble or they were going to be sued uh, or, char or charges brought against them, they would be tried in a, under U.S. jurisdiction in a U.S. court. Uh, so it was really an unequal situation. And Japan is actually going to be forced into several, to sign several unequal treaties with a number of countries. Uh, pressure from the U.S. And, Brit and Great Britain led to the resignation of the last shogun in 1867 and the restoration of the emperor to power in 1868, which brings us to the Maijai Restoration. So a 15-year-old emperor, Maijai, was enthroned in Kyoto on April 6, 1868. And at the same time, uh, they signed a, an oath, which was the Charter Oath, which was basically an outline for modernizing Japan. Japan realized that they had been put in a, in a, in a very tenuous situation by uh, not modernizing. So they're going to go through a rapid modernization process. So it's outlined and it had five clauses, and the introduction is, by this oath we set up as our aim the establishment of national wealth on a broad basis and the framing of a constitution and laws. So one, a deliberative assembly shall be widely established and all matters decided by open discussion. Now remember, this was, had been a feudal society, right, with very, very, uh, great class distinction, caste systems, the, the whole nine yards. So this is very different. All classes, high and low, shall be united in vigorously carrying out the administration of affairs of state. The common people, no less than the civil and military officials, shall be allowed to pursue their own calling so that there may be no discontent. This was a big thing. So what this basically meant was that you could move around. You had free will. You could choose to work in an occupation um, that you chose. And you'll notice this, say, civil and military officials, no longer are they, are they trapped in this um, feudal system of, with a liege lord that you owed uh, uh, you know, an oath or obedience to. There was freedom. Evil customs of the past shall be broken off and everything based upon the just laws of nature. Right? That's enlightenment. But that's an enlightenment idea. So you can see this is a very liberal uh, uh, statement here. And knowledge should be th sought throughout the world. So that as to strengthen the foundation of imperial rule. Okay, so they're going to go out into the world. Lee. I don't know if this is a good time to bring it up, but Product directly impacts conquer because that's how William Miller got to go to Japan and help set up the University of Sapporo. Wow. Yeah, that's a yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's a, that's a great point. This ended feudalism in Japan was replaced by a constitutional monarchy. Sort of. Sort of, yeah. Okay, Emperor Maija is the 122nd emperor. Of Japan, 120 Meiji. Meiji. Yeah. I'm sorry, Meiji. I, <laughs> I, you correct me all just the way through, for, and I'm sorry, but they just bothers me. Meiji. No, I, as it should, as it should. My Japanese isn't up to par. <laughs> so he was the 122nd, the 122nd emperor of Japan, and some of these emperors. I, I have to memorize all these 122 names. Oh okay, well, let's hear it. Uh, <laughs> started with uh, uh, sun god, and then somehow the emperor started with <laughs> Well, that's okay. We won't hold you to it. But she makes a good point. From the sun god, it was believed that they came from the sun god, so divine right rule, right? Which is a term we've yeah. heard we've... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. He ruled from 1868 until 1912. So is the what era? Major. Major. Major era, 1868 to 1912. The government was uh, modernized. Goals would focus on Western ideas, including military and economic reforms. In 1871, they dispatched 
a mission around the world, and now I'm afraid to say it. <laughs> Iwakawa? Iwakua. Thank you. Uh, in an attempt to negotiate the unequal treaties, which failed, they weren't able, actually able to pull that off, but they did study Western methods. They also sent Japanese students uh, uh, throughout the West, the United States and Western Europe, to learn uh, modern ways to study economics, and um, they hired advisors to come in from the West who were uh, experts in industry and uh, in economics to improve their country. Within 25 years, industrialization brought wealth and power and allowed Japan to become the only non-Western world power and a major force in East Asia. Impact of Westernization. Yes, ma'am. was able to catch up so quickly was all the boys were educated in temples. It, it was not a public school, but the education was pretty much at the grassroots level. So they were, high, they were so already they were highly literary, educated. Literary, yeah. Literary, able to oh. read. Yeah, yeah that's a very the good point. Yeah, I know, it's a very good point. So the point uh, made here is that it was, they weren't starting from ground zero, they already had, were literate, which is a huge advantage um, for improvement. So westernization changed all aspects of Japanese life, uh, arts, education, etiquette, down to justice politics. Japan borrowed from the Prussian constitution well, it's, which is kind of interesting because the Prussian constitution uh, was a constitutional monarchy. So they had the, what would become, well, the Kaiser, if you will. They also um, had in, in Prussia, then Germany, a Reichstag, which we're gonna look at, which is a legislature, actually a two house legislature. But the Kaiser uh, maintained a veto power as, as our, president has a veto power, but it was a stronger veto power. Uh, it wasn't, couldn't be overridden. So that's what they chose to, as a copy. They did outlaw the caste system, including the carrying of the katana, which is a short samurai sword, and displaying the samurai top knot, which was a uh, particular way they did their uh, hair, the samurai warriors. These reforms would eventually bring conflict between the samurai and the Meiji government. Now, Meiji political reforms. In 1889, there was a new constitution of the Empire of Japan, which formally granted the emperor powers. So, and this is creating the, this constitutional monarchy, okay? So it, he's a monarch, but who has to follow laws. Uh, Article 4, the emperor is the head of the empire combining in himself the rights of sovereignty, so the power flows from him, okay, down through the sun god, through the emperor, uh, and exercises them according to the provisions of, pre of the present constitution, so the provisions of the, of the constitution. Article 6, the emperor gives sanction to laws and order them, orders them to be promulgated and executed. In Article 11, the emperor has the supreme command of the army and the navy. In 1890, a bicameral imperial diet, or legislature, was established for the House of Representatives and a House of Peers. So not unlike, again, Prussia or even England, if you will, with the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Uh, by 1920s, Japan grew more democratic with an elected diet, began to exercise power, and by 1925, there was universal manhood suffrage, but woman, women would not receive the vote until 1947 after the war and under occupation. Meiji economic reforms. So the government highly subsidized businesses and industrial modernization. Powerful companies with government connections known as Zaibatsu, did I say that right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, thank you. Zaibatsu 
borrowed and adapted technology from the West and soon took control of Asia's manufactured goods market. Mitsubishi, Suzuki are two well-known examples of Zaibatsu companies. And Japan, an island nation, a small island nation, not sort of not unlike Great Britain, was really limited in natural resources, which is going to play a major role in their development as a country, but also uh, sort of explains the aggressiveness of their foreign policy that we're going to see, is this need for natural resources. The government built model industries or uh, model factories to show industries, you know, and help them modernize and grow. Economic reforms include a unified currency, the yen, uh, banking, commercial, and tax laws, stock exchanges, and communications networks. So this is all from a country that had been, again, in a feudal system, basically been a uh, agriculturally based nation. Um, the, by the 1890s, they become a modern capitalist nation, in other words, a, a nation that works on investment and, and, and the exchange of, of capital or money. Many of the former daimyos, or feudal land-owning lords, invested, the new economic growth to, uh, new, the, invested in the new economic growth, and they were quite wealthy. Now, they're going to also contribute lots of money, along with the Zaibatsu, to political parties. And, of course, corruption is, is going to uh, develop. The empire. So Japan, after being humiliated by the unequal treaties, and if you remember when we looked at immigration a few months ago, the, the immigration policy of the United States, and we talked about the Gentleman's Agreement, right? which was between Japan and the United States, uh, basically Japan agreed, the government agreed, not to allow immigration to the United States except for highly educated or, highly, or very wealthy Japanese individuals. Well, that was not looked upon favorably in Japan. And um, the government is going to be highly criticized for this. In 1876, the Japan-Korea Treaty, which was an unequal treaty in the favor of Japan, Another copy of the West, they learn well, right? Um, forced Korea to open up trade with Japan. Now, Korea had, had been a tributary state to China, which meant for a long, long period of time, they'd been sending money, basically, if you want to think of it as protection money, uh, to China. And they were within China's sphere of influence. 1894-1895, the first Sino-Japanese war was fought over the control of Korea. Japan won the war and received Taiwan uh, from China, but was forced by Germany and France and Russia to give up uh, the Liaodong Peninsula, and, uh, which was an important piece. So they were frustrated there once again. The West is blocking them. Japan creates an empire, continued, okay. The Boxer Rebellion, which takes place in China. Now, that was a, uh, 1900, was a nationalistic rebellion. Uh, China had been greatly um, impacted by foreign traders. If you remember the United States, uh, the um, open door policy. Um, and so the countries were all moving in. They weren't colonizing China, but what they were doing was setting up uh, port cities, trading port cities, uh, controlled by the foreign powers. So the Boxers were a group that, um, that rose up and attacked the Westerners in the country, physically attacked them. Many countries set, sent in uh, troops to put down this uh, rebellion, which they successfully did, and Japan actually sent the most troops in and so benefited from this as well. The Boxer Protocol, which was basically the agreement after the Boxer Rebellion uh, signed by Japan and the Western nations, and China was forced to sign it, gave Manchuria, or northern China, to Russia, but allowed Jap Japan to keep troops in China, okay, to protect its citizens who were living in China. 1904 and 1905, we talked about this before the Russo-Japanese War was fought. 
and this really indicated the growth of Japanese strength. It was, for the most part, naval battles. Russia was thought to be this huge empire, and they were very quickly defeated by the Japanese. Again, frustration occurs for Japan. Teddy Roosevelt, who receives the Nobel Peace Prize, of, of all people, right? He's an aggressive guy. But does help to uh, sign a treaty, the Treaty of Portsmouth from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And Russia had to give up the Sokol, a part of the Sakhalin Island and mineral rights in Manchuria. Uh, and then in 1910, Japan moves in and takes Korea, really with little opposition. So now they have control of Korea. World War I in Japan. So Japan joined the Allies fighting against Germany and the Central Powers during the war. Japan quickly attacked German holdings in Asia and the Pacific. Japanese ships also helped protect Allied shipping in the Mediterranean. So again, this new Japanese Navy is, is very, doing very well and very powerful. Japan was granted Germany's colonial territories in Asia under a League of Nations mandate. And the territories consisted of Xingtao, Xingto, close enough? <laughs> okay, maybe not. On the Chinese Shantung Peninsula and the formerly held German islands in Micronesia. That one I know, okay. Emperor Tashio? Taisho. Taisho. Taisho is the 123rd emperor of Japan from 1912 to 1926. And we get to Hirohito, you're gonna, you're gonna think it's the same photograph because they look a lot alike, but there is some family resemblance for sure. Okay, problems though arise in Japan. So we have this rapidly growing, expanding country becoming very powerful, reaching out, uh, starting to try to create an empire, throwing a lot of weight in, in, in around in East Asia, but they're gonna have problems. And it has to do with the 1920s with an economic uh, slowdown. And I think we're going to see, as we look uh, in Italy and Germany as well, uh, a lot of this has to do with the Depression, the Great Depression and the economic slowdown. Rural peasants enjoyed none of the prosperity of the city dwellers, so they were unhappy. The factory workers in the city were earning low wages and so they are attracted to this new movement, right, of uh, socialist ideas of Marx and Lenin, which certainly aren't going to make the Japanese government very happy. The younger Japanese were really revolting against tradition. They adopted Western fads and fashions, rejected family authority for the Western notion of individual freedom. And I, you can only imagine the upheaval that must have brought, uh, in, both within families but also within the, in the country. Conservatives, especially military officers, blasted the corruption, including payoffs by the powerful Zaibatsu, and they condemned Western influences for undermining basic Japanese values of obedience and respect for authority. Rise of ultranationalism. 1929, the Great Depression, which we looked at a few months ago, or I guess last month, right, travels across um, the oceans and hits Japan as well. Hurts their trade. Few people could afford to, uh, silk was a big uh, export. You know, they're high, really high quality porcelains and arts and and all this were, were very, very popular. Um, and you, you see this on Antiques Roadshow, right? You see things that people had brought over uh, earlier than this during this time so are, are, were really sought after and really quite valuable. Well, they lose that export trade and resulting in high unemployment. The economic disaster feeds content, discontent, excuse me, with the military and the ultranationalists, okay? 
So they're becoming unhappy. They're all, the Western powers had also blocked Japan's overseas expansion, and the ultranationalists were furious that the Western empires were, had such large empires, and they looked at their own empire as being really tiny, and they're saying, this just isn't fair. We are a great people. We are a proud people. Asia for Asians, we're going to get there in just a minute, the next slide, yeah. Okay. So, ultranationalists. The ultranationalists did not agree, not, did not disagree with the Maijai oligarchs' adopt, adopt, uh, yes, adoption of, you can pronounce this for me. Which one is uh, it? Uh, Fukoku. Yeah. Rich country, strong military. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Rich country, strong military. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's what I love about this crowd. No matter what our topic is, we have experts here to, to help us out. So, um, however, they believe that the nation had sacrificed its tradition. So they like the idea the ultranationalists did, the militarists did, of modernization. They weren't against modernization. They certainly weren't against Japan becoming a powerful country, but what they didn't like was changing the values and the traditions of the country to achieve these goals. They were also outraged by the racial policies, once again, United States, even Canada, and Australia, which had excluded Japanese immigration. And Japan was, their population was really growing, and of course it's a, physically a small place, so they really needed to export some, some citizens. Japanese took great pride in their industrial advancements, and they felt that they were being treated as a second-class citizen. 1925, the Washington Naval Conference was held. Now this was actually, of course, after World War I, and if you remember, one of the causes of World War I was the arms race, which back in the, in the early part of the, the 20th century had to do with the building of dreadnoughts, who could build the bigger, bigger batter, bat, you know, the biggest, most powerful um, battleships. So Japan was on, you know, was expanding their navy, but they are forced to agree, as are actually the European countries, to limit the size of their navy in this Washington Naval Conference. They also believed that the League of Nations was favoring the West and preventing J Japan's expansion. And if you remember the League of Nations, you couldn't just go out and take other nations or other territories. The League of Nations would step in and say, no, we, you know, we're going to respect sovereignty, Woodrow Wilson's idea. But of course, it's not going to work out. As a result, Japan began discussing the East Asian Federation or Asia for Asians. Okay, not unlike what American doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine from, from the first part of the 19th century that said America was for Americans, right? And Europeans basically were close to colonization, were close to, we don't want you to dominate us economically, America is going to watch out for ourselves. So this is what Japan is basically saying. This exclusion of Japan by the United States was followed almost 50 years by the exclusion of Chinese. Yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. Very, very good. To meet the need for raw materials as an outlet, uh, Japan's and Japan's increasing population, as I had mentioned, the ultranationalists start demanding that they that they expand further, increase the size of the empire. 1931, the Manchurian incident, not the Manchurian candidate. <laughs> I had to check that. I said, am, am I just pulling this out of the back of my memory here to make sure I was using the right term? And uh, it's almost like the war with Mexico, to tell you the truth, how we had sent troops down on the, on the, the Rio Grande to sort of get the, to cause an incident to, to create a war we could take Mexico or part of Mexico, Texas. So the Manchurian incident, Japanese officers uh, blow up some tracks that were Japanese owned 
blame the Chinese, okay, and therefore they're able to move right into northern China and seize Manchuria. This is the Japanese army without the government's permission or direction. They're doing this on their own. And they uh, set up a puppet government called Manchuko. The ultranationalists defend their action by saying that Japan needed a lifeline to raw materials. So here we go into these raw materials or an economic reason again, right? And they, uh, because Japan's economy was stagnant, the Depression was hitting, this is 1931. When the League of Nations complained, Japan simply withdrew from the League of Nations. When government officials objected, uh, the people actually sided with the military uh, rather than the government officials because they, they believed that the military was taking action to help, to help them, okay? Throughout the 30s, the Japanese military would continually increase its power at home and expand Japan's uh, empire abroad. And this is just a quick map of Japanese expansion. Uh, the main part I just want you to see is where Manchukuo uh, was located in northern China. Okay. And of course, they're going to ex expand throughout the 30s until they finally, right before Pearl Harbor, take Indochina, French Indochina, Vietnam, Cambodia, which the United States will shut off their oil supply because of that, leading to Pearl Harbor, and then leading to us entering World War II, but we'll get there next month. Ultranationalists gain power, so how do they come to power? In the early 1930s, ultranationalists were winning popular support for their foreign conquests in a tough stance against Western powers. So this is playing well with the Japanese people. The Prime Minister, uh, in, Inuke uh, Shioshi? Inukai. <laughs> Inukai, okay. <laughs> was assassinated, okay? It was assassinated in May 1932. In addition, several other polit political figures and business leaders were also assassinated throughout this time period. Uh, by patriotic societies, which are ultra-national societies, many of whom uh, military officers belong to. And in 1936, the military actually plots a, a coup uh, to take over the government, and they occupy uh, downtown Tokyo, the center of Tokyo, but it, uh, it does fail, but they are going to gain political control. Okay, in power. So the ultranationalists increased power, and they began reintroducing traditional values, such as the Code of Bushido, which was the warrior code, the way of the warrior. Um, the, it revived ancient warrior values, built a cult around the emperor, so um, emperor worship, if you will, and, um, but more so, it's also, when we, went, when we looked at our Russian history a couple of years ago, and we looked at Stalin and Lenin and how Stalin built the cult of personality, or Kim Jong-un also does this, um, and, and the Korean uh, dictators do the same thing. Uh, in schools, the students uh, studied the way of the emperor's subjects, and they were taught absolute obedience to the emperor and to the state. Uh, by 1937, the military dominated the government, cracking down on socialists, and many democratic freedoms were, are disappearing. And then, of course, they're going to attack uh, China uh, terribly uh, in 1938 and on. And Southeast Asia, as I mentioned, December 7th, tomorrow, right, is December 7th. Uh, uh, wasn't the emperor just a symbol at this point? Well... The, uh, it's very interesting. Um, basically, yeah, they're not going to him saying, what should we do? And the emperor says, okay, we're going to go into Indochina, then we're going to attack at Pearl Harbor. Not at all. So, and he was this exalted figure, but again, the military are really in control. And um, as I understand it, he would write haiku poems to the military to say how he was feeling. 
Okay, so, and, and I suppose within their, within the culture of the time, maybe that made sense. It's hard for us to understand that, but you're right, you're right, Charles. It's, it wasn't, the emperor's really not in control. He's a figurehead. He's like the king of England, basically, at this point, except for a religious before figure. Twitter. What's that? Before Twitter. Yeah, before Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before Twitter, absolutely. Okay. So I think we've wrapped up Japan. Oh, Emperor Hirohito, the 124th emperor, and uh, reigned a long, long time, I think 63 years. Um, and there was, that was, of course, a big discussion, and it took a while. Well, we're going to get there when we talk about World War II. I shouldn't talk about that now. And, of course, Tojo, who was the general of the army, ultranationalist, really the leader of the ultranationalists, 27th prime minister, uh, who was the prime minister from 41 to 44. But he, he's really the architect of a lot of this ultranationalist expansion. Yes? By the way, was it traditional that the uh, general of the army would be the prime minister? Not at all. Yeah, no. It, uh, um, I don't, I think he may have been the first, but this was not traditional for the, it was, they were political figures. And the, the Japanese government were, was a fa fairly liberal government, meaning that they had allowed Enlightenment ideas. We saw, you know, the, the clauses that they were building their modernization on, which the military hated. So finally, he is asked to be prime minister. They've, they've, weakened the parties. They haven't actually done away with the Japanese political parties. In a parliamentary system, the leader of a party becomes a, the prime minister. Uh, so he wasn't a party member. Um, it was sort of like, okay, we're in war. We need a strong guy as prime minister. Certainly not separation of church and state, though. Okay. All right. Before we go on to fascism in Italy, we're going to have some holiday treat. So uh, please, uh, my wife's just going to take the saran wrap off. And, and uh, again, we try to, she, she tries to bake something that has a theme. So, uh, and what we've discovered, these cookies, which we originally looked up the recipe as Russian tea cakes, are also very popular in Germany and in Italy, and I, probably not Japan, I don't know. But uh, they, uh, anyway, so enjoy. Okay, we'll take about a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. Okay, so we're gonna move on to fascism in Italy, ultra, another ultra-nationalist movement, what becomes fascism, and we're gonna go back a little bit and see how that develops and why that develops in Italy. We did, uh, I guess it was last spring we did unification of Italy and, Je and Germany, I guess, it was last spring. So many of you were here for that, um, but background anyway. So um, Italian nationalism began in 1815 uh, at the Congress of Vienna after the defeat of Napoleon. Now, uh, it, this could be argued, right? Uh, Italy, of course, ancient Rome was, you know, very powerful, controlled much of Europe all the way into England. They controlled the whole Mediterranean area and extremely powerful. Uh, but of course, they're going to fall apart, if you will, uh, the fall of Rome around 450 uh, AD. And so Italy had been divided up into many separate little states and usually controlled by other countries, more powerful countries. Well, Napoleon, during, from 1801 to 1815, uh, the, um, uh, the coalition wars, as they're called, because co many countries are coming together to fight against the French and Napoleon's expansion and all the, the different permutations there are of that. He invaded um, Italy several times and conquered different parts of Italy. So when he's finally defeated um, at Waterloo in 1815, uh, they hold a uh, conference in Vienna uh, to basically try to put things back together. The, uh, the monarchs of Europe had been uh, really terribly frightened. The church, the Roman Catholic Church, had been frightened. 
um, by this uprising, by these new Enlightenment ideas that the French Revolution had brought along. Napoleon, as, we, as you remember, was in some ways an enlightened guy, like he, the Napoleonic Codes were, were really, um, which are still used throughout some of Europe, were um, in some ways very enlightened, but uh, militarily he really was a, a power to be reckoned with. So they hold this conference, and Italy is upset because it's divided up again. Okay, it, they had fought uh, against Napoleon um, with the Austrians, they'd helped the Prussians, and they thought they were gonna receive more than what they actually received. So they're gonna be upset. So an Italian nationalist, and, this, and if you remember how confusing a, Italian unification was when we looked at it, there were all these different figures and uh, coming in, these important guys, but I've, I've really narrowed it down for our purposes here. So uh, Mazzini founded the uh, re It's a resurgimento, okay. I should have studied those languages harder in, in school. <laughs> Madame Hardy is, you know, if, if she watches this video, she's, she's going to be laughing at home or shaking her head probably. Um, but anyways, uh, movement to unify Italy succeeding in 1870. So they're unified in 1870. And this is the, a map, and I know you can't really see much, but you, right in the center bottom, of course, is uh, the, um, Italy. And in 1815, as it had been divided up by the Congress of Vienna. And you can see by just all the different colors that it was really divided up. Okay. And then this is off of a, <laughs> this, the, the clearest map I could find, it was actually off of a travel site. Where I still, <laughs> This, uh, stole this, but it shows you basically the outline of, in some of the major cities in Italy today. But you can see it goes w w way up until what, for instance, what Austria had had and France had had at one time. Okay. So after unification, this is where we start to get, it starts to get interesting. Uh, the Italian government was faced with domestic political paralysis. It was very difficult, not unlike, if you will, trying to put together the United States of America after the Revolutionary War. You had all these different states, all these different Italian states. In the northern Italian states, they tended to be educated, they had industry, they had wealth, and they kind of looked down on the southern Italians. <laughs> The southern Italians, okay, were agricultural based, okay, not as uh, well educated, if you will. And so to combine these different groups with even different, you know, accents and all, not unlike the North, you know, at the time of the Civil War, educated, wealthy, industrial versus the South, agricultural, sort of similar to that. Um, so there was a lot of political problems. The Prime Minister of Francesco Crispi, the main efforts uh, to increase Italian nationalism was to promote imperialism, to divert the Italian citizens' attention from Italy's domestic problems. Wag the dog, okay, if you remember that movie from several years ago. Italy was successful in that it colonized some East African coastal nations of Eritrea and Somalia. They actually failed, though, in Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, you know, and, and they lost 15,000 Italians in the process. 1911, 1912, they're going to fight the Ottoman Empire, the, the sick man of Europe, if you remember us when we talked about uh, the Ottoman Empire prior to this and they took Libya in North Africa. These attempts, though, to gain public support actually failed. And there were protests, riots, rebellions, and it looked like the country might fall apart. Rise of ultranationalism. So three Italian intellectuals, uh, Danuzio, Mosca, and Pareto, founded Italian Nationalist Association, the ANI, in 1910 with a goal of overthrowing the liberal parliament, parliament, 
parliamentary uh, government and the never-ending political turmoil. Enrico Corradini, okay, who called for Italy to return to the uh, glory of Rome. So he's the first one to publicly come out and say, we've got to get back to our glory days when, when Italy was great, when Rome was great. He said the Italians need to live dangerously. He emphasized mar uh, martial hero uh, heroism, total sacrifice of the individual to the nation, and the need for discipline and obedience of society to the glory of Rome. And the Italian people responded enthusiastically. Okay, they were being told, basically, you guys can do it. You're great. You're great people. You can do this. So, Italy in World War I. Now, in 1882, they had joined in a triple alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary. But when World War I broke out, they actually remained neutral before they joined the Allied powers. They, they, their reason for remaining neutral, they said, was because the Triple Alliance was supposed to be a defensive uh, alliance, and, and certainly Germany and Austria-Hungary were not being defensive. So it was, it was a pretty good reason not to join. But they had also negotiated for spoils of war, if you will. In other words, again, you know, we'll join, the, we'll join the effort, but we want some things to come out of this, okay? And great nationalism, great pride rose up when they, in fact, won with the Allies in November 1918. Um, frustration quickly set in, though, uh, at the Treaty of Versailles when uh, they were not... They did not receive what they thought they had been promised for the helping the Allied effort. Anybody know what this symbol is? Yes, the fascist. The fascist bundle of sticks, right? And where was what was that symbol of? Rome, right? The uh, ancient Rome, the power of ancient Rome. I'm sorry. And the axe head as well attached to it, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, fascism and ultranationalism. So fascism is based on nationalism. It's a nationalistic movement, if you will. And it's actually original to Italy, or to ancient Rome and then to Italy. Uh, fascism believed that the Risorgimento was incomplete and they wanted to complete it by unifying or incorporating the unredeemed lands of Italy. So there were Italian speakers in different places, um, and so they wanted to bring those under the, into a greater modern Italian nation, the modern state of Italy. The National F uh, Fascist Party was founded in 1921 uh, and declared that the party was to serve as, and quote, a revolutionary militia placed at the service of the nation it follows a policy based on three principles, order, discipline, and hierarchy. The third Rome. So the fascists saw modern Italy as the heir to the ancient Roman Empire. They said the first uh, Rome was the ancient Rome. The Italian Renaissance was the second Rome. And a modern Italian empire would be the third Rome. Fa fascist leaders, including Benito Mussolini, and we're going to get a little bit more into him in a minute, uh, wanted to emulate the ancient Roman leaders, specifically Julius Caesar in rising to power, follow his example, and then Caesar Augustus for building an empire. So this is, this is who they're emulating, is these Roman emperors. Okay, Benito Mussolini. Born in northern Italy in 1883, he's the son of a socialist blacksmith. So he's brought up by a socialist in northern Italy. Um, he is, his father was actually a fairly active socialist, and um, so he's, he sort of absorbs this. He's sent off to boarding school, um, and in 1901 he qualifies as an elementary school teacher. So you've got to watch out for those elementary school teachers. <laughs> right, Annie? <laughs> yeah, and my wife, yeah, okay. 
uh, and my mom. Yeah, is she here? Oh, there, she's back there. Okay, sorry, mom. Didn't see you back there. Um, in 19, so he becomes an elementary school teacher. In 1902, he went to Switzerland to avoid compulsory military service. So he takes off to Switzerland and he joins an Italian socialist movement that's, uh, that's operating in Switzerland trying to overthrow the decadent liberal democracy and capitalism, oh by the way, in, uh, in Italy. He, he really becomes active and he, he actually begins to do some of his writing, his political writing uh, at this time in, in Switzerland. He's arrested twice for advocating general strikes. In 1904, uh, the Italian government actually uh, offers amnesty, and so he goes back to Italy at this time, and, but to accept amnesty, he had to uh, go into the army for two years, so he does that. Um, after the army, he, wants a, he again goes into teaching, but he actually becomes much more involved in his writing and his um, socialist uh, movement. So, 1909, he begins working for various socialist newspapers and he even publishes a novel. Um, it's a political novel, though, and it actually is an anti-Roman Catholic Church political uh, novel. That's the, the theme of the novel. And in 1911, he participates in a socialist-led riot against the Italian war in Libya and was jailed for five months. He's released from jail. He becomes an editor of the leading uh, Socialist Party newspaper, the Avanti, uh, increasing its circulation from 20,000 to 100,000. So he's, he's very successful at this. He um, is considered an excellent journalist. And he actually works for the Hearst News Service until 1935 as a part-time uh, journalist in submitting uh, articles. He's expelled from the Socialist Party and uh, at the outbreak of World War One, there were, the socialists were really um, uh, conflicted socialists throughout Europe about uh, World War One. Uh, the socialists, a lot of socialists, said, "No, we need to be pacifists. We shouldn't, you know, take play, you know, part in this capitalist war." Um, where other socialists said, "No, we need to take part," and especially the French socialists. Uh, are really pushing. So uh, he decides, no, we should be involved, so he's actually kicked out of the Italian Socialist Party. His political transformation. So he starts, uh, started as an interventionist newspaper. He, he begins an interventionist newspaper uh, and a political group called the Revolutionary Fasci for International Action. And this is, of course, going to become the fascist party, if you will. Uh, he's funded by an Italian armament firm and by French socialists who are trying, to, because they feel that he has a chance of convincing Italian socialists into coming into the war. Um, while he fought in the war, he switched his loyalties. So he does fight in the war from class struggle to intense nationalism. He becomes an intense nationalist. In 1917, he's in a trench and a bomb lands in the trench. He's fairly severely injured. I, I, I don't know if you can say fairly severely injured. He's pretty severely injured. Uh, that's not even right. He's severely injured, uh, <laughs> survives, and he goes back to editing his rightist newspaper. And a few photos. Upper left hand is 1917, probably shortly before he was injured. On the upper right, uh, Mussolini in the 1920s, um, as he's coming to power. Uh, and then Il Duce, or Italian prime minister, and the dictator Mussolini in the 1930s. My French, another, other than Madame Hardy, I had a, a French teacher at Concord Carlisle High School who was a, an Italian man, great guy. Um, and he told us a story as a little boy. He was, um, uh, it was a grape, grape harvest time. And so he's in a big you know, container. All the kids were smashing the grapes, you know, crushing the grapes. 
and Mussolini came along in a big black limousine and stopped and talked to them and patted them on the head. So that was his Mussolini, his Mussolini story. Okay, Mussolini organizes the fascists. 1918, um, he, in one of his articles, he calls for the emergence of a man ruthless and energetic enough to make a clean sweep and revive the Italian nation. Who do you suppose he's talking about? <laughs> yeah, himself, yeah, right. So in 1919, he begins organizing veterans and discontented Italians. Uh, he gives fiery speeches calling for return to Roman greatness and to the end of government uh, corruption, and he promised order and prosperity. What else does he promise? Somebody said it. Well, the trains will run on time. Yeah, the trains will run on time. Last year we were in, in uh, I guess, Florence, right? Going, and we were going to take the train to Venice. And my wife was so concerned that the train was not going to run on time because on the big board where they display which tracks and the, the Florence uh, um, rail station has umpteen tracks and our train wasn't listed and she wanted me to do something about it right then and there. <laughs> yeah. But in fact, we made the train. And I guess it ran pretty much on time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, March 23rd, 1919, Mussolini reforms the Milan Fascio as the Fasci Italian de Combattimento, or Italian Combat Squad. He had about 200 members. And they're going to be known as the black shirts. They all wear black shirts, sort of uniforms. And they go around beating people up. It's basically a gang. They attack uh, socialists and communist uh, rallies, they smash leftist presses, attack farmer unions and cooperatives. So basically anybody that's leaning left at all or socialist, they're going to attack. Now bid for power. Throughout 1920 and 21, the black shirts using intimidation and violence ousted elected officials throughout northern Italy. They were trying to block the power of legally elected officials. Now, they were supported by many Italians who had lost faith in democracy. Okay? 1922, the fascists organizes a march on Rome, and 30,000 fascists will march down from Milan towards Rome, and they enter Rome. Uh, they're they're uh, chanting, you know, on to Rome, on to Rome. And Victor Emmanuel III, who is the king of, of um, Italy, really is frightened for the country. And so he gives in and asks Mussolini to form a government, which Mussolini does on October 28, 1922. He becomes a legally appointed prime minister of Italy. Okay, the fascist in power. So 1925, he's extended his power, taking the title of Il Duce, the leader. He suppressed rival parties, censored the press, limited the number of eligible voters. <laughs> Pregnant pause. Uh, rigged elections. In the province and towns, he replaced elected officials with fascist supporters. In theory, Italy was still a parliamentary de a democracy, but the fascists routinely imprisoned or exiled or murdered their critics. They also used secret police and propaganda to uh, ensure support of their regime. A couple of propaganda posters. The one on the left is really nice. terrible, right? So you've got the outline of Italy, right? And the, the young child's face or head and then reaching in in a sort of a scary, violent way. Upper left, what is that? The Star of David. Upper right? Yeah, the, the hammer and sickle. And 
Charles, what's down? Mason. The, the, yeah, the, the Masons. Okay, the Masons, seen as a real challenge to the fascists. On the right, now this is an interesting one. This was a campaign to uh, collect money. And we're going to see that it's, of course, a totalitarian state. Uh, they're wedding rings, right. And Mussolini asked all the Italian wives to donate their gold wedding rings to the cause, and they would receive and return an iron wedding ring, which must have been real comfortable. Fascist policies, the corporate state, okay? Now the corporate state, to encourage economic growth and end conflict, Mussolini put the economy under state control, um, but he brought in business, labor, government leaders, and fascist party members to set economic policy. So he's gonna be overall in control of the economy, but he is gonna bring in these various groups, and his idea was, was to prevent conflict. It, it, not so really different uh, than what was done in the United States in World War I. Um, if you remember, Wilson had basically, uh, they didn't nationalize industry, but they basically organized it, and again in World War II, to have an efficient industry. Um, production did increase, but at the expense of the workers who lost the right to strike, and of course their wages remained very stagnant. Social policies, okay, Italian citizens constantly face propaganda urging them to believe, obey, fight through loudspeakers and on posters. So they face this all the time. Women, yeah, who bore not 14 children, more than 14 children, in excess of 14 children, would receive a medal, a motherhood medal directly from the hand of Mussolini uh, to help with unemployment, women were forced out of paying jobs and into the home. Um, and, and fascist youth groups were formed, and fascist beliefs centered around school. Strict military discipline were taught in uh, school, and children were taught that Mussolini is always right. Did anybody ever read the short story, of the, what, the Sounds of the Zicada? That, that's, it's about a young boy in school uh, during uh, Mussolini's uh, reign and how he's being fed all this and he hears the cicada. Okay. Fascist beliefs uh, summed up. This is just to kind of bring it together and make some sense of it. Today we refer to any non-communist authoritarian government. A lot of people will say, oh, it's a fascist government. Okay, and you've even heard that term referred to to our current administration. In the 1920s and 1930s, fascism meant different things in, in different countries. All forms of fascism, though, shared some basic features. One, they were all ultra-nationalistic. Glorification of action, violence, and discipline, and most importantly, blind allegiance to the state. They were anti-democratic, they were against enlightenment principles of equality and liberty. And they believed that individuality and social freedoms destroyed the goals of the state. So that's the base, that, that was sort of the common values, if you will, of, um, of fascism. Yes, Judy. Among the Italians that left, was Enrico Fermi? Michael sure, yeah. yeah. And a lot of them, they just got the hell out of Yeah, no, it, it, it's right. That's right, and of course we're going to see the same thing in, in, in Nazi Germany. Yeah, right. Right, right, and Mussolini um, was sort of back and forth on race. He was really much more concerned with uh, with culture and sort of with groups and things like that as a, as opposed to purely racial issues. Now, of course once he gets in cahoots with Hitler, Hitler's gonna push him into um, taking part in uh, the terrible Holocaust. But, okay, Nazism in Germany. I yes. The Pope was fairly uh, powerful at that time. Right. How did that balance with fascism? 
Yeah, they, they sort of came to an agreement. Uh, in fact, Mussolini um, basically denounced his own book, the novel that was about, that was anti-Roman Catholicism, to sort of uh, win support uh, of the Roman Catholic Church. And um, it's an area I actually want to read more into because um, I think it would be very interesting. I don't know that much about it, but I would like to know more about the role. And there's been some discussions about it since, um, but there's been some books read about it. You would leave the Vatican alone? Yes. You sort of make peace with the church. Yeah. They just as long as they left the Vatican alone and the Catholic Church alone, that was okay. then the rest was okay. Yeah, and they'd leave him alone. So basically, it was they came to an accommodation. Okay. Right, right. Okay, background to German ultranationalism. So, again, last year we looked at unification of Germany, and of course, Otto von Bismarck um, was the chancellor. He's not the king of Germany, but he's the chancellor of Germany. He's a Prussian, and he used the concept of blood and iron okay, to unify Germany, to build German nationalism, and we know that he fought three wars to do this, uh, but played it just right to build nationalism as he's, you know, basically winning these wars. Um, Kaiser, during World War I, the second Kaiser, because when Germany's um, unified in 1870, it's, it's Wilhelm I, this is his son, Wilhelm II, who is the grandson of Queen Victoria, right, and the, the cousin of the Tsar and the English king, um, uses extensive propaganda and nationalism to make great sacrifices for the war. And, and probably many people in here have, have seen um, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front or read the book, right? And the students, the high school students are sitting in class and the professor is saying it's your duty to join the army, it's, you know, you're a German, for the fatherland, right? So there's a very strong sense of nationalism that comes out. Now, in 1918, November 1918, November 11th, of course, the armistice, this all falls apart and Germans really lose a lot of confidence. And, of course, they go to the Treaty of Versailles, which is just horrendous for Germany, uh, and really, in a way, horrendous for Europe. Um, in 1919, the Weimar Republic is established, and it's a very liberal parliamentary government. It's actually, if you look at the, and I've done this, if you look, compare the, the Constitution of the Weimar Republic to the Constitution of the United States, the Weimar Republic is more liberal. It's actually more liberal. Um, it's a, led by a chancellor. Now, under the new constitution, both men and women enjoy uh, suffrage, the right to vote, and there's an extensive Bill of Rights. Now, in Germany, as in other nations, there were many political parties. Uh, not, you know, a couple years ago, we talked about the two-party system in the United States. Of course, that doesn't hold true in the other countries, so they have to build coalitions. In other words, bring two or three parties together to get a majority to then be asked to form a government and have a prime minister. Well, that's all well and good, except for those coalitions break apart very easily because they're, they're uncomfortable bed partners. Um, so uh, there was lots of turmoil in Germany during the 1920s. Unrest. Okay, and un there's a lot of unrest. New government came under constant fire from both the political left and the political right. Communists demanded revolutionary changes like they'd seen in Russia. Um, again, this is early on, 1919, 1920s, uh, con before they really, before Stalin really came in. So some of the world really viewed Lenin as a positive figure. Um, conservatives, including the old Juncker class, Military officers and wealthy bourgeoisie attacked the government as being too liberal. Germans of all classes blamed the government for the hated Versailles Treaty and the guilt clause, because in the, in the Versailles Treaty they had to admit to guilt 
of the war, saying that they caused the war, and heavy reparations, financial reparations, that were really heavy, and the country could not afford to pay them. Now, they also were looking for a scapegoat, okay? And many Germans blame Marxists and Jews for an imaginary, I wanna, I should have underlined it, imaginary conspiracy to betray Germany. Hyperinflation sets in, and I'm sure you've all heard of this, which brought great misery to the masses and who looked for an energetic leader to restore Germany to greatness. Okay, Adolf Hitler. Born in 1889, he's a failed Austrian art student, an ardent anti-Semite who fought for Germany in World War I. Okay, and he's actually gassed in World War I. He returns back to Germany, not to Austria, but to Germany, and um, in 1919, he soon became the leader of a small group of ex-soldiers who hated the liberal Weimar Republic. Um, he, he would go, they would be in um, cafes or saloons or bar rooms, if you will, and people were getting up and speaking, and they were all angry, and, and he got up and spoke, and people actually listened to him, and he had a voice. He found he had a voice that people would fall, follow. The group soon joins the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which they will uh, morph into the Nazi party and take over. Like Mussolini, he organizes a, gr a gang of brown shirts, uh, or stormtroopers, as he called them, who again, like Mussolini, are gonna go and beat up the communists and beat up socialist groups, other opposition groups. And in 1933, Hitler led a failed attempt to seize power in Munich. He's jailed, but while in jail, he writes a book. Or mein Kampf, my struggle. Mein Kampf, okay, reflected Hitler's obsession with ultranationalism, anti-Semitism, and racism. According to Hitler, Germans belong to a superior master race of Aryans whose greatest enemies were the Jew, okay? They, uh, again, go, looking for a scapegoat. We lost the war, you know, we're destroyed. It's not, it's not your fault, it's their fault. To revive Germany to its former greatness, Hitler urged Germans, wherever they lived, to unite into one great nation. Germany must expand, ex, uh, expand, find living space or a Liebenschraum for its people. And Slavs and other inferior races must bow to the Aryan needs. To achieve these goals, Germany needed a Fuhrer, a strong leader. Sound familiar? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's really following uh, Mussolini right down the path, and you could maybe even go a little further than that. Now, Hitler is going to use symbolism. Hitler was the first guy to really understand media, okay? Now, um, at the same time, FDR, with his fireside chats, was using the media very successfully. Um, but this went way beyond it. Um, up in the upper left, you know, you've got the swastika, the, the symbol, the Nazi symbol, the straight arm salute. He would also hold these rallies. And I used to tell my students that, you know, I'd ask them, have you been to a rock concert? And of course, most of them had been. And Hitler rallies were not really different than that. Quite often they were held in outside stadiums, and he would have his airplane come in and circle the stadium a couple of times, land. He'd then come in in a long leather trench coat, okay? Come, of course, strutting in onto stage. He would start off with just a whisper, and you could barely hear him. And developing his, well, his, his hateful talk, really. And, but then he would increase the volume and increase the energy level till at the end, he was just letting them have it, okay? You know, the rock concert, the, the encore, okay? And really, really would energize the crowd. And 
I, I'm, don't take me wrong, I'm not praising him, I'm just saying he was a very gifted politician. Okay, an evil man, but a politician. Lower left, of course, is the Hitler Youth, and um, was a huge movement, um, and the uh, German students were really encouraged to become members of the Hitler Youth, and they would have their own rallies. And then a terrible poster, uh, the caption reads, Behind the Enemy Powers, the Jew. And you see the, the, a fellow with a, a Star of David behind the British flag, American flag, and the Soviet flag uh, with a ter just a terrible scowl. Of course, they had films and they, um, uh, they had Goebbels, uh, the head of propaganda. Yes? I was reading what I told you before, the author, Eric Marie Remarque. Yes. He said, um, when they had the first big book burning in Berlin, he said, first they'll burn the books, then they'll burn the people. Yep. And then he, he left. And he Marie left. And Dietrich left the same time. Yeah, and uh, he, he was the author of All Quiet on the Western, Western Front. Front. He got the hell out of there. Yeah, yep. Okay. Road to Power. Okay, so after prison, Hitler continues to speak publicly, and really the movement's building. It's, it's gaining momentum in members. The Great Depression, of course, really helps Hitler. Probably wouldn't have risen to power without the Great Depression again. So we, we see this in Japan, we see it in Italy, and now we're seeing it again in, in Germany, the impact of economic depression. Um, the... Uh, he promises reparations, he promises to create jobs, and to rearm Germany, okay? He found financial support from German corporations who liked his fight. They backed his fight against communism, against German Marxism, because again, they're afraid of Marxism, just as, as uh, the Italian businesses were backing, backing Mussolini. With government paralyzed by internal divisions, both the communists and Nazis, won more seats in the Reichstag. The Reichstag was the German uh, parliament. And finally, in 1933, other conservative politicians decide that they must accept Hitler's vulgarity. Okay. <laughs> Another pregnant pause. Um, accept his vulgarity and back him for chancellor. Um, Thus, Hitler, like Mussolini, becomes le he's a legal head of state. He's elected to, and chosen by uh, Hindenburg, who was the president of the Weimar Republic. Okay. Hitler's third Reich. Okay. Within a year, Hitler creates a series of false crises. They burn the Reichstag, right. Um, blame it on the communists. He, he uh, attacks even his own... Um, the leaders within the Nazi party who he feels might challenge him, okay, and has them killed. Um, he disbands opposition groups and becomes a dictator. So, uh, you know, I used to say to my students, whatever you do, don't ever let the government take away your Bill of Rights, your rights as a citizen. They're so important. Even if you hear things or read things that you don't like and you say, those should not be allowed to be printed. It's important, okay? It's important to allow free press, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, so important. Hitler demanded absolute loyalty for his Third Reich. Now, the First Reich, he said, was the Holy Roman Empire, neither holy nor Roman, okay? The Second Reich was Bismarck's empire formed in 1871, and then the Third Reich was to rule Europe for a thousand years. He forms a totalitarian state where all citizens were to serve the Nazi government. And all aspects of life, from religion to schools, were controlled by the government. The Gestapo and black uniformed SS troops enforced Hitler's will and rooted out opposition. Um, and they really did. I mean, it was per pervasive through the whole country. Um, this really tight grip on the people. Hitler's policies. Economic policies. Hitler used large-scale public works projects, not unlike 
what FDR was doing in the United States, but he went much further. Uh, and the rapid rearmament of the German military to increase employment, and they did increase employment. We were, a few people came up during the break, and we were talking about this, and uh, he was uh, Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1938. Uh, now this gentleman said correctly, you don't have to be a good guy to be Time Magazine's Man of the Year, uh, but he did have an impact, a big impact, and of course, it hadn't come out yet what he was doing, at least people weren't as aware of it or weren't accepting it, if you will, what was happening uh, to the Jewish population. And perhaps they didn't care. We'll Hitler preserved capitalism, but brought about big business and labor under his control. A little different than the corporate straight, state under Mussolini. Um, but few complain because he was really bringing up the standard of living in Germany, and certainly from, from what it had been in the 1920s. And a lot of people were, were um, enjoying this increased standard of living. Workers joined the Strength Through Joy programs, which featured exercise and outdoor vacations. Of course, this was to get citizens ready for military service. The social policies, he indoctrinated young people through schools, Hitler used summer youth camps, huge rallies, uh, just for young people, um, and where they were urged to destroy Germany's enemies. Nazis sought to limit the role of women, again, in business and universities, forcing them back to their true calling of motherhood so as to produce more Aryan babies. Now, he, as, as this rapid expansion of the economy, he actually, this actually impacted wealthier, upper middle class women, uh, more than it did working class women because he found they actually had to work in the factories to meet their um, goals. Purging the German culture. Of course, propaganda was a huge tool in education, art. He, de he denounced modern art and music as corruptive Jewish influences. Um, what's that movie that the... Um, few years ago, I, I'd show parts of it to my students, the, the, um, the dancers, the, the kids that danced. Do you remember that movie? Swing Kids, yes, thank you, The Swing Kids. If you haven't seen that, that's actually a terrific movie. The, it's called The Swing Kids, The Swing Kids, and it's about um, young high school kids growing up in this time period, and they were... Uh, Swing dancers, they love jazz and, and swing dancing, which was outlawed. So it's about that. And it's, 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 it's great for historic history because it's true, but it's also great if you like swing dancing because it's unbelievable. Yes? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not even sure it was so hidden. Uh, yeah, the, the history of anti-Semitism in Europe, of course, was, was from the Middle Ages, really, um, and really throughout history. But he really focuses on it. It's, it's one thing, and they, there would be certainly attacks on Furches in, in Russia on the uh, Pale, uh, the Jewish ghettos and things like that from time to time, and I'm not belittling this, but this, he's going to, of course, go way beyond that um, and really takes advantage. But I think you're right. So there was the, maybe not so far under the surface, but he was able to pull that out and use it as a political force. Yes? Can we just hold that for our, our final discussion? Because that, that would fit in well with our final discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, though, for bringing that up. It's important. Um, he or the Nazis revised old German myths, and the music of Richard Wagner was glorified. 
school textbooks are rewritten to reflect Nazi policies and racial views. Public bonfires, as Judy was mentioning, uh, to burn books that were on a disapproved list, including All Quiet on the Western Front, which is actually an anti-war book. That's when the author said, um, remarks that first, first they burn the books, then they'll burn the people. Yes, yeah, man, that was... And he got the left. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Hitler despised religion, organizing all Protestant sects into one single state-controlled church. He closed Catholics, Roman Catholic schools, and... Uh, muzzled the clergy, okay? Ca the campaign against the Jews. And this is, could be not only a, a whole lecture, this could be a, a whole course, really. But, so this is very, um, very brief, just for our time constraints. But he was fanatical, anti-Semitism. He's set to drive out all Jews from Germany. It's, it, there's been a lot of discussion why he was so anti-Semitic. His father had died young. His mother had gone to work as a, as, a, uh, as a housekeeper for a Jewish doctor in Austria who was very, very kind and supportive of Hitler, so it shouldn't have been anything personal. Some people think uh, that he, when he went to Vienna to try to be an art student, um, it was very multicultural and that just drove him crazy, all the multiculturalism, but if you will. It is, it is always, but, but he goes beyond. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Know, but it wasn't that hard to really to, load up. Right, right. So in 1935, the Nuremberg Laws, which was a series of laws, and I'm sure you've, you've all heard of these, uh, both social and economic restrictions, um, which really starts to put pressure on people. So you can imagine how difficult it was for the Jewish families living in Germany. Your roots were there, your, you know, your whole lives, your you know, whole family histories were in Germany, and to get up and leave must have been terrible. Um, you know, the, the having to wear the yellow, oh, I'm sorry, the yellow star of David on... Uh, on your chest, uh, you couldn't work in certain professions, you couldn't teach, you couldn't attend university, just terrible restrictions. Then, of course, two nights in 1938, Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass. Jewish homes, synagogues, businesses were plundered, burned, Jews were physically attacked, and then Hitler makes the Jews pay for the damage. Isn't it more that he just had to have something to hate in order to bring himself to power? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that's true. He, he actually focuses. Now, I guess the question is, uh, was he just doing it because he's a really smart politician, or was he doing it because he really hated the Jews? I, I think he really, he, yeah, I think, well, no, I think he was really hated. I think he really hated. Yeah. The Jews could leave. They could get out, but then nobody would let them in, including America. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was again going going back to our immigration talk. You know, there were such restrictions. I think I read that um, uh, the U.S. senator from a Broadway was senior, and Edith North Rogers, who was a congresswoman from the North Shore, yes. had a bill in Congress to bring in about ten thousand Jewish children under fourteen. Wouldn't cost anybody a penny. Yeah. They tried to push it through, went nowhere. Mm. Just terrible. Eventually, of course, the Jews are forced into ghettos, uh, and millions are then sent to concentration camps, which are work camps and also death camps, where he finally brings about his final solution, um, and just horrendous. Okay. Discussion. We didn't miss the last slide. Was that? That was the last slide. Okay. So, discussion. Oh, yes. So I think, if you remember last time, we had trouble with the handheld mic, but I think I figured it out. So if I shut this one off, because we, we had two mics on the same frequency. So if I shut this one off and turn this one on and l lower the volume, how's that? That's still too loud. 
How's that? That's better, right? Yeah. Is that, is that okay? Yes. So, what circumstances would have to, or did you want to ask a question? I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, curiosity, did it, the semitism increase uh, during the Great Depression? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would say yeah, any time that there were is economic problems, uh, groups are going to, especially targeted groups, are going to have a harder time. Well, as a Jewish person, having uh, looked at the stock market the last few days, <laughs> I fear safety. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just. Is the wasp run it anyway? I'm sorry? I said the wasp run it anyway. Oh. So what circumstances would have to occur for ultranationalism in any of these forms or a combination thereof to take hold in the United States? Let's get some discussion going on this. Um, uh, excuse me, there's so many obvious ones. Um, but I think um, a bad feeling about yourself, either on an individual or national level, could also be a factor. And, and the, um, people who have chosen for some reason to not know what's going on and all the emotional components of that are just a factor that we don't, maybe we don't look at. That's, that's a good point. And I guess, I guess if you look at where uh, ultranationalism arose, the negative aspects of it, they didn't feel good about themselves. The, the Japanese Americans were very proud people, but they felt that other people, were, yeah. In this case, I think it's just a partial of a cause. Oh, yes, okay, partial cause, okay. And um, going back to the question, I guess, about uh, the depression, right? So economic hard times would certainly play into it, but what else? Make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> Make America great again. Yeah. We ask that you use the mic because some people are hard of hearing. Um, he wanted more. Um, the Great Britain. Um, it just, it, yourself, besides the uh, Jewish people and, um, and also other people that are persecuted, you know, uh, well, religious people and mentally, he just wanted more. Uh, he wanted, the, I think, the Great Britain factor. Um, when the United States found out that uh, he was going after, um, you know, he wanted Great Britain. I, I'm trying to word it right. So, so you're saying that he wanted to expand and be able yes. to take Great Britain? Yeah. Expand. So, yeah, ex expand. It just a, yeah, an obsession. Okay, so how. So, obsession is just going, you know, now it's beyond Germany and it's Great Britain. The world. the world, yeah, the world. How, how does that reflect, though, in, in today's world on how the United States could end up in a similar situation? And maybe you think it couldn't. I believe it's China, instead of the United States. Okay, China? Okay, okay, so you, so you think China's the, the, the fear for the United States, okay. Don't let me hit your knee there. There you go. You'll know it. <laughs> yeah. well, I think that when a leader, a president, will um, give uh, cred, uh, uh, will give credence to a group of hatred, people who hate, that becomes more acceptable. And if there are good people on both sides of the street, it, it's just the beginning of uh, the leader saying it's okay to focus hatred on the Jews. And I am Jewish. Okay. So when, when they get licensed, if you will, yes. by the leader, um, they can lead to horrible things. Yeah. Someone else, yes, could you pass that down, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't want to say shut it down, uh, but in a way I do, of uh, newspapers. 
that are oppositional to the leader. Yeah. And just making them seem as though they are not telling the truth, when in fact they are. And I think that's one of the biggest dangers right now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you hit a really important factor is any time a free press is, is attacked or, or shut down, that's one of the first things that dictators do is they get control of the press. Um, and um, this country, of course, we've had a long history of strong press. Now we have opposition press and supportive press and all features. And I, from, from my own point of view, um, this 24-hour news cycle that we're on, I think, plays into some of this mm -hmm. because you have the talking heads on both sides um, that are just 24 hours a day looking for something to talk about. And so people can get fixated on a certain station or a certain um, mindset. Yeah. mindset. Yeah, thank you, Ann. Who, um, and then they become ardent in it. And, they, and so I think that's, that's a really important point. Charles, did you want to? No? Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, if you really truly come head to head with China in a militaristic uh, fashion uh, and they declare uh, martial law, I think that would definitely uh, be an opening for you know, fascism or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. I, I know there's been great concern in this country to have so many generals becoming part of government. And uh, though they have, to a certain extent, they've seemed to be the, the mature ones in the government. Ma'am? Cutting off. Yeah, please, pe please, please. I, I just had to too close. Oh, okay. Just do the best you can. Cutting off immigration. Okay. Cutting off immigration. Yeah. No yeah. S certainly. Uh, that's a big issue. Yes, Lee. One thing I noted in Japan, um, the women didn't have many rights until 1947. Then in Italy, having women be barefoot and pregnant all the time, and then the same thing in Germany. So keeping women down and just you know, not making their roles seem important and trying to objectify women rather than have them be participants in the political process. And what just happened in, in November? Yeah, we. So hopefully that's a hopeful sign. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. Sort of the silencing of the women, and women tend to be the ones that are really looking out for a stable society and a safe society, and maybe that's a good sign for the country. Because that's one, and that's a, actually a nice segue into why would this not happen in the United States? Why would we not end up in? a totalitarian situation with a dictator? What are some things in place? Oh, I'm sorry, Judy. Well, I think Roosevelt probably saved democracy in, in, when he was elected, the same time when Hitler was elected. Yes, yeah. yeah so he, he just probably saved democracy. And how did he do that? Uh, with all the policies, you know, with the... And he had Eleanor. He had Eleanor. He had Eleanor. <laughs> Very good. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> WPA and all that right. people back to work. Yeah, it prevented people from becoming so desperate that they didn't turn to. Um, I think my father worked on some WPA project. I'm sure a, a lot of people here. Yeah, 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 it was very, very common. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. Someone else? Yeah, I want to pass it down. Thank you. Uh, the question you ask is what circumstances? Uh, that's tough analyze what, what brings these things to happen, but I did want to make a contribution. For some time I focused on the problem of political groups that develop a, a loyalty more to their group than to the nation. And, and that's, a, that's a red flag. It happened in Germany, and it is in some areas happening in this country. And that, that's a, something to watch very carefully when groups put their own advantage over the advantage of the country. Yeah. 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 I'd just like to say that I think it's going to be difficult uh, to have
have that take home in the United States for the simple reason we have such a long uh, tradition, a democratic tradition, uh, whereas some of these other countries were relatively, were relatively new in that period of time. So I, I don't think that would really uh, take hold. It's just people wouldn't accept it. Many of them would be right. Yeah, I, uh, you both make really excellent points. I, I think uh, the history of our democracy, um, which, you know, where are we? We're in Concord, Massachusetts. The, you know, yeah, the, the, start the start of it all, not only uh, the, the, of the war, but also, you know, 1635. By 1642, we have, a, you know, basically a, a meeting place to come together, we have a local government selectmen, we have the, the, the colonial assemblies, so we have this you know, multi-hundred year uh, experience with democracy in this country. Um, and I think that's really, really important. The other gentleman makes a really good point too, which our founding fathers strongly believed in. And I think um, an example, again, you heard all this, if you watched any of the funerals or the tributes to George H.W. Bush um, of going beyond just partisan politics and reaching across the aisle um, or doing what may not be necessarily the best for you politically, you know, no. read my lips, you know, and then, and, and then, oh, I know, then going back on that uh, and, and doing the right thing by saving the country from, from an economic downturn. Um, was really important, and the Founding Fathers really had that in, in many ways. In some ways, you know, slavery and whatnot, they fell short, but in many ways, they really did have um, this sense of, of the greater good for the country, not for what's best for me politically. Can you pass that over again, Ann? Thanks. Those principles, however, are the, now the dying of the light, push going into the end of the greatest generation. Uh, or into a, a new world. We sit here in Concord, Massachusetts, and we are so isolated from the rest of this country, or even after what's happened in the last two years, 40% of the people still say, he's a great guy, let's re-elect him. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really have a handle on what's going on out there. I don't worry about the very principles you talk about of whether the founding fathers will, will, will come through and continue to be true. Yeah, we can pass that for. Can you just pass it up? Let me sneak through here. I just want to make a comment, which I thought was very interesting. Comment on your comment, which was uh, very interesting about when you become more committed to your tribe than to the good of the whole world. So I just want to make one little comment that it's both on an individual as well as a national basis that we need to belong to a tribe and how to deal with that. Okay, yeah, well, that's, that's a very good point. And how to make the tribe bigger. <laughs> how, how to make the tribe bigger and more inclusive, I guess, I guess too. Um, you know, excellent, excellent points. Oh, I know what I was gonna respond to you, sir, too, as well. Um, Andrew Basevich, who's a retired BU professor, is wonderful um, political commentator, has written several books, and, and one of his theories is, um, that the American people in today's world um, are being lulled by consumerism. Um, that we're, especially in Concord, right, we're, we're well off, we have a really nice, you know, to a certain degrees, but we have a nice standard of living for the most part. And um, he also makes the point when the draft, the military draft was ended, in the early 70s after Vietnam, um, that most families aren't impacted by war. Uh, and so we're not, as, um, we're not as tuned in, we're not as ready to combat um, some of these decisions that are made by the government. I grew up in the 60s. And uh, when there was, uh, I know several people in this room did, I see heads nodding, and there was a lot of protest. And I remember turning 18 and signing up down in West Concord, where tea cakes is now, 
there was a little draft office, you know, for, for the draft. And um, I'm not embarrassed to say I was frightened, <laughs> you know, just. But with the draft, there's so many exemptions. If you were in college, you're all exempted. And if you got out of college, somehow some, a fearlessly worked, figure out a way to stay out of it. Yes, some people, yeah, some yeah. Some people yeah. figured out a way. Well, yeah. 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 That, yeah. well, yeah, but uh, there wasn't this, yeah, yeah. That, that with the um, low lottery, uh, that, that'd be. World War II, everybody went in. That's true, World War II for the most part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so this, between consumerism and then, and then also not being tuned into uh, necessarily the decisions personally, okay, that's a, that's a real difference for the American people, I think. Um, and I guess we call ourselves lucky, but it is concerning. And this, the greatest generation, which I, I believe in as well, they, were, they did a lot, and we've got some of them in this room. Annie over here, a veteran of World War II, right? Give her a hand. Is Thurston still here? I know he's a veteran. I guess he might have left, but he was a World War II. Oh, Charles, I'm sorry. Captain Davis. <laughs> World War II veteran. Anybody else in here? Well, they're in their 90s. Yeah, yeah, they're in their 90s. Yeah, they'd have to be in their 90s. So we thank you all for your service. And uh, any other questions or final comments? This has been a great discussion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hang on, so, so people can hear. Uh, to thank all the veterans, all of them, for keeping us free. And if, if, I wish we had more veterans. It's hard to get. A lot of them are passing away. It's hard to get the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. I do work with a lot of them, and especially some Vietnam veterans. And anyone will tell you we will fight to the death to protect and keep our country, no matter what. Right. And even though we have the sections that people, uh, you know, get, say, addicted to or whatever their, their ideas. Yeah. And overall, I, I think more, any veteran will tell you that, you know, it's, uh, you know, they, they actually know too much that's going on. <laughs> they look, um, but it, they're a great, it's a great, um, they give a, an awesome insight. It's nothing like being there. Yeah. In fighting, in the, and then to translate that to more people, I think Iraq and Afghanistan wars brought a lot of that. People felt so bad about what happened to the Vietnam veterans. Yes. And how being spat on and the baby killers, and now I think mm -hmm. the public is now more aware. Right. Of our, our, right. Our, what our service members do yeah. to keep us free. Yep. So yep. even with all these factions, it's just the whole stir up. You know, the media the, uh, can be good and bad. Um, it's tough. The media is tough on wars. War, war is money. War is a money maker mm -hmm. also. So um, if we could get more input from veterans, it'd be great. Yeah, no. But we'll, they'll defend to the death, so. Yeah, yeah. I'm just one of those. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your comments. The, we're, we are just about out of time. Um, Anyone want, want the last word? How about great job? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I, I always appreciate and, and really am humbled that you come and take part in this. Um, as a retired history teacher, this is wonderful for me to be able to talk with bright, interested, Young people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really my wife's baking. Yeah. How about a hand from my wife if you like the cooking? So. so the next talk, a little commercial here, is January 10th, 1.30 to 3.30 here. It's the coming of the Second World War, aggression, appeasement, and war. Um, and I want to wish you all a very happy holidays and safe and enjoy your families and, and getting together. And, and thanks again for coming. Thank you. Okay.